Um, so this morning we, we have a couple of sessions. We're going to start off um, with a crisis uh, media management. Without uh, further ado, I'll introduce uh, Sarah Brady, our uh, next speaker, who will speak on crisis media management. Uh, Sarah Brady is the president and CEO of uh, Sarah Brady Public Relations. She specializes in crisis and reputation management. Uh, she's a former news, uh, newspaper reporter with more than 20 years experience in communications from writing, public relations, and community relations. A couple of key highlights there. She actually um, had uh, the distinct circumstance of simultaneously working on Christina Grimmy shooting at the Plaza Life Theater, the attack at Pulse Nightclub, and the tragic loss of a child at Walt Disney World. So without further ado, Sarah Brady. Thank you. I think there's a clicker here. Okay, let's see if I can... Um, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, I uh, was asked to talk about crisis management and social media. Um, I, I um, have a lot of experience in it. I have some fun stories to tell you, or interesting at least, maybe not so fun. Um, but I think you'll find much of the information relevant. This is my background. Hasib just gave a little bit of my background. But um, so I, um, I think what will be interesting and relevant is like in the last few years, um, I started out as a newspaper reporter and I covered the police beat and courts. So I've seen the uh, justice system and law enforcement. I currently work with a lot of law enforcement agencies across the country. I work with a lot of nonprofits, so I'm very familiar with all of the dynamics and the issues that nonprofits experience. I chair a nonprofit uh, currently and I've chaired other boards. Um, but my, in my background, um, I started my business in uh, 2010, so I've been in business for eight years. Uh, I worked at Lockheed Martin in the PR department after I left the newspaper business. Um, I ultimately went to the cable industry. Um, anybody from Orlando or all of Central Florida, you've heard of Bright House, Net Bright House Networks. That's where I was the VP of Public Affairs. And in cable world, everything happened. So I have seen it and done it all. Um, but in the last few years with my business, I worked on the Trayvon Martin case. I represented the police chief from Sanford. Um, the, as he said earlier, Plaza Live, that happened on Friday, June 10th. Pulse, not the not Pulse nightclub attack happened on Sunday, June 12th. And then this accident at Disney happened on June 14th. And I worked all three of them. I still work all three of them. We're in a different phase. But as you can imagine, those all three were global stories. So I was talking to news media 24 hours a day. Granted, they're not nonprofits, but the dynamics and the tactics and the strategies are all the same, no matter whether you're for profit or nonprofit, if you're an individual or if you're a corporation. So that's what I'm going to cover today. Um, I teach at the Kennedy School of Government. I teach crisis management. Um, and I've served on, these are a couple of the boards, a gift for teaching. Uh, I was on that board for eight years. I chaired it for um, twice, I think. Uh, the Orlando Science Center served on their board, the, Orla the Orange County Library System. One of the top systems in the country, I chaired that board. I was on that board for eight years. I currently chair um, Central Florida Community Arts Board. So I, those are just the ones that I've um, volunteered with. Those are not the ones that I've worked for because I work for nonprofits quite a lot when they're in trouble. So I'm going to cover kind of what a crisis is, um, how they feel, and sort of generic uh, information. And then I'm going to focus on actual uh, cases. They're not nonprofits. And the reason that I'm, because uh, I can't really talk about the ones that I work on necessarily, um, but I want to show you the uh, magnitude and the impact of what social media can do. So how many people here love social media? Exactly. Just, just a few. Um, but we have to appreciate it. We have to use it. No one can ignore it. Uh, so it's a, it's a tool. Uh, but it has changed everything in communications and in, and in how an organization communicates. Um, and, and if anybody has a question, raise your hand. I'm fine with that. Um, but but what's a, you know, what is a crisis? It's something that threatens uh, harm and damage long term to an organization, its leadership, um, and to the organization's reputation and ultimately to its survival. Basically, it's something that you know, can shut down your organization. Or it's something that simply, it's something that goes wrong and everybody finds out about it. Um, nobody can predict every scenario, even myself. When I go into an organization, I ask them what are the likely problems, what are the likely issues that you'll face. And that's what you prepare for. But again, the strategies and tactics, they're going to be the same, but you can't ever know 
everything that's going to come your way or that could come your way. What matters is how you handle it. I have a little fun things in here too. Anybody watch Scandal? Remember that show? Well, that's what I do. I've, except I've never slept with the president. <laughs> or buried a dead body. Or hidden a dead body, I should say. Um, so the worlds that, that um, these issues come in are a court of law and a court of public opinion. And the court of law, the rules are very clear and defined, and they really don't change. But in the court of public opinion, there aren't any rules, and they change all the time. Behavior changes all the time. And so it's the, the digital platform is really the courtroom of public opinion. And I work with legal teams all the time. I currently, I'm working the Parkland shooting. I'm working with their lawyers on a regular basis and how they respond to all the litigation that's coming versus um, what the public information should be are different. And, uh, and that's the same for every, every incident. Um, and what lawyers, um, you know, lawyers are trying to protect a business and an organization um, in every way possible through the legal system. My job is to protect the organization's reputation and how people see you because you have to preserve your trust and your credibility in order to stay alive. So they're two different goals, um, essentially. And frequently, um, lawyers don't appreciate the court of public opinion as much as they appreciate the court of law. And sometimes um, I'll butt heads with attorneys. But most of the time, I have a really good relationship and work well because I understand the court of law. I, I went to law school as well. So I have a great appreciation for all of that. But it's my job to represent the organization to the legal team and explain why the court of public opinion matters as much, if not more, than the legal side. So the elements of crises are instability and unknowns. Anybody been through a crisis? I mean a real crisis, not just something that feels bad. Okay, so then you know. It's, it's, you just don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what's coming. Um, the stress and chaos, it is remarkably stressful. Um, just imagine, like Barbara Poma, who owned Pulse Nightclub, she's just chugging along with her business, she's in Mexico with her daughter, gets a phone call that there's been an attack in her club and that, you know, people are dead. She has to come back from Mexico within a couple of hours and deal with her whole world had been turned upside down. She lost her business, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm talking on terms of the client, you know, and what their experience is. Uh, stress and chaos, you know, are unimaginable. Um, competing voices and interest. Um, you know, you'll have a board of directors, uh, and you'll have your staff, and you have lawyers, and you have the media, and you have your constituents, stakeholders, everybody. And everybody's got a different priority, pretty much. Um, keeping everybody aligned is really critical. I represented a city once that had a major controversy with their police chief, and the mayor who did who only had the authority to break a tie vote, that's all the you know, legal authority he had, um, wanted to be the face of the city. He did not like the town manager. And I got them together, they hated each other, but I got them together and I said, this is the time that you have to have game face. You have to show a united front when you go out publicly. You have taxpayers and citizens and he absolutely refused to do it. So he worked behind the scenes, he went off the record with media, he deliberately worked against all of my tactics on behalf of the city. So if you're not aligned, and, and it extended their crisis for a few months. So those competing voices and interests are really a difficult uh, issue to handle. Broken trust. Um, as a nonprofit, you need your donors, you need public trust, you need your constituents to have faith in you, so that's critical, but that's, that's one of the issues. And then fear, and I put it in red because fear is the biggest dynamic that I have to deal with because everybody's scared. If it's the CEO who's committed some kind of a uh, misdeed uh, or a staffer, uh, they're afraid of what's going to happen to them. It could be criminal activity, it could be losing their job, it, you know, it could be a variety of things. Um, staff is worried because leadership is compromised, uh, don't know who's in charge, uh, don't know if they're gonna go under, um, they don't, you know, what's true, what's not. So the fear factor is enormous and it's one that my responsibility is to try to minimize that. So when I come in, I'm very unemotional. I, you know, I have people cry, you know, frequently they're crying or they're upset and it's all fear and my job is to come in and try to manage all of that. 
So your op your options are you can freeze and do nothing uh, and let yourself just you know weather through it and probably you know go under, um, or you can think about it. You can be strategic and you can own your own story. And that's the way that um, these are the most effective ways to move forward. So you have to determine if it's real or if it's a perceived crisis. Just like I asked if anybody had been through it, is it just something that feels bad? Is it a real crisis or is it just a negative issue? Because that makes a difference. Um, you know, a negative issue is just something that um, it's unpleasant. It's probably not, you know, it's not your best face out there, um, but it's not going to harm you in the long run. Um, a brewing issue is one that's just percolating out there. You all might know about it. You're, you know, the CEO might know about it. Board members may know about it. Uh, I, I, I think uh, an example of that would be um, at CBS um, with Les Moonves, where half of their board at CBS was aware that there was uh, that these charges were out there um, floating around the community. The other half of the board apparently did not know. Um, and that one ultimately bubbled up and became a real and active crisis. But this guy here is what it feels like. You feel like your hair's on fire, your head's going to blow off. Um, and if you've been through one, then you know that. So, you know, which is it? Uh, it brewing, it, if it's in the initial stages and it's quiet, you, are, you may have the opportunity to prevent it from getting any bigger. And uh, that's, that's a, not necessarily a hard thing to do. Sometimes it's just a matter of picking up the phone and calling who the parties involved or getting the facts. And, you know, maybe it's nothing at all and shutting it down. Um, if it's negative, um, sometimes it's just letting it run, run its course, and take a hit for a day or two. Uh, the, um, or if it's an active one and gets widespread attention and has long-term potential for harm, you have to address it. And those are the ones that are uh, difficult, complicated, um, and, you know, life-threatening, essentially, for your organization. So, you have to figure out what is it that you need to do? What do you want to do? These are your goals. The number one goal is you want to preserve the integrity and trust of your organization. Uh, you can't afford to lose those audiences. So you want to either prevent or minimize the damage. Um, you have to reassure your stakeholders. You have to maintain as much control as possible. Some days it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes the smallest wins are the biggest. Um, you want to avoid prey to falling to the uh, prey to the public debate. That's always a big one, and that's where social media. You will see social media, you know, can draw you in. Um, I just did it the other day. I, I tweeted something to Sarah Huckabee Sanders um, just because it, I just kind of fell prey to some of the noise that was out there. So you have to be really careful about that, and that's where you're going to have to deal with your staff and have some uh, guidelines for communicating and and how you respond to things. Um, you want to tell your own story. What are the facts? You know, what, what actually happened and who are you and who have you always been and who will you be in the future? Um, you have to keep the emotion out of decision making and that's fear is an emotion, um, you know, sadness, heartbreak, all of those things. Those cannot factor into how you determine what you're going to do. And then you have to tell the truth and it's always, always, always tell the truth. And telling the truth and being transparent do not mean you tell everything. If you, if you are unable to share information, that's what you're supposed to say. That's being transparent and that's telling the truth. So these are the threats. Um, the issue itself, what's, what's happened out there? What's brewing out there? What are you being accused of? What went wrong? Um, leadership. Leadership can be a, a big problem. Uh, I have worked for CEOs that are, um, you know, they're a little ego driven and kind of internalize and um, personalize an issue and make it all about them uh, and they might want to take charge thinking that's what a leader does and not really knowing what to do. So ego is an issue and if, if you have to be the one to talk to the CEO and the senior team, that's a really difficult conversation to have. Um, the lack of acceptance, uh, not acknowledging that there's an issue or that somebody's at fault. Maybe it is the CEO. Those are, those are big obstacles and threats. Employees. Employees, uh, if they're unhappy, disgruntled employees, uh, they can, you know, share information. They can, um, you know, go on social media. Uh, if they don't feel engaged, they, they are a threat. Stakeholders confidence. If you lose that, you know, how do you get it back? Are you able to get it back? News media. Now, the news media landscape has changed a lot. Has anybody ever dealt with news media? Okay, it's, it's, it's so different from when I worked at the newspaper when we chiseled newspapers out on stone. Um, the, uh, you have to laugh at my jokes. Um, 
the, the newspapers are uh, newspapers are sort of a dying industry, which kind of breaks my heart because I always wanted to be a newspaper reporter. But the, the reality is there are a couple of papers that are doing really well right now, and those are the big papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Those are the three biggies. Uh, but overall, um, here in Orlando, the Orlando Sentinel is struggling. Uh, Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel is part of that company. Um, and you will see that there's, you know, readership is down. I, I would bet most of you do not get a newspaper on your doorstep every day anymore. You might read it online, um, but but those have changed. The and as a result, um, they're not funded. Um, they have cut staff. They've cut their editors, copy editors. The decision making processes have changed dramatically. So newspapers are sort of losing their influence and their impact in a, in the big picture. They don't, they don't have the uh, staff to really cover things anymore either. So if you're trying to pitch a really good story about your organization, it's really difficult to get them to bite sometimes on something really positive. They just don't have the manpower, they don't have the space. Um, so, um, so the newspaper aspect has changed a lot. And television news too, local TV news, um, their viewership is down, their staffing is down, they don't cover positive news a whole lot. If there's a big issue that they think is going to be scandalous, they're going to jump on it. Sometimes they create the scandal or exaggerate it, make it much bigger than it is. Uh, you know, very lopsided coverage. And their hierarchy and their checks and balances structure is so different from print. So that's a big issue. So social media has become the, you know, the platform that everybody goes to for information. We're all getting information day long from Twitter and from different resources. If it's political, you're getting it from The Hill or Politico or, you know, wherever. And, and uh, the publications that are related to your industries, um, you're, you're getting news from those related uh, sources. And that's uh, that's a smaller audience for you. It may not be local for you. So it's a it's a whole new world out there. Time is a huge threat. When did you find out about the issue? When could you address it? How quickly can you get answers? How soon can you get somebody's interest? How soon can you talk to your constituents? How quick? Time is a huge obstacle and threat. And then social media, which I just referenced, and then lack of readiness. Um, I would say this, and you'll hear me say it a little bit later too. It is naive to think that your organization, as good as it is, and as honorable as it is, uh, and as well funded, and as well run as it is, to think that you are not vulnerable to something happening. Um, somebody can get mad, uh, doesn't mean they're right, going to Yelp and other you know, uh, websites um, and criticizing you. Those are real issues. Um, if you have um, employee issues, employees, um, disgruntled employees, they're a huge threat. And so no matter how well run you are, you have to accept that this could happen to you. And you should have some kind of plan, the most basic kind of uh, plan, even if you don't have a staffer uh, or a consultant or whatever, you should have something in place. See how happy they are? Then that happens, all that. <laughs> It all changes. Um, so you need to kind of review. Is like I always say, questions, confusion, unhappiness. You know, what happened? You need to find, this is what you have to ask yourselves. If something's out there, is it true? Uh, it is, you know, find out. Uh, it could be, and if it isn't, you know, confirm that. Um, who's going to be hurt? Is it an individual in the organization? Is it a, a leader? Is it a staffer? Is it an ex-employee? Is it the organization as a whole? Um, how's our uh, trust? How, you know, our, is the public going to be suspicious of us? Um, if anybody's uh, you know familiar or remembers the Central Florida blood banks here uh, about I'm going to say eight, eight or nine, ten years ago, um, which was a big uh, you know, it's a big nonprofit, and the CEO lost her job um, as a result of this kind of issue that went on for about a year and a half, the coverage. At that time, the newspaper still had a pretty robust investigative team, and they were all over her and the way that she ran the organization, and she, she ultimately lost. And I would tell you, um, not that I would know anything about what happened internally, um, she was encouraged to step down and resign to avoid being terminated, and she refused and ultimately left, um, not, a, not on her own. Um, so that organization has a serious, uh, had a serious credibility issue, um, and it still, it still lingers a little bit. They're sort of re redesigned now and restructured, but, but they're, they're not what they once were. Um, 
So what information's out there and what can you talk about? What shouldn't you talk about? What do you know? Who do you talk about with? And when do you tell them? Who, your board members, employees, your partners, vendors, who do you talk to and you know, what do you say? Um, and then the big question is, can you recover? Are you going to survive this? Uh, and sometimes the darkest of days, you think you can't. But again, it depends on how you handle it. I'm an eternal optimist. And let me just say, I've seen the worst of the worst of humanity. I saw it as a reporter. Uh, I'm married to a retired police officer. I saw it in law enforcement. Uh, and I see it now. Pulse Nightclub is a shining example of the worst of the worst. Um, and that's that's... It seems like you can't overcome something, but um, in many and most cases, I would say they are, you, you can survive, but you have to do it with honor. Um, so the essentials in, in doing that and getting to that point are communication, and I put that number one. And communication, in my opinion, is always the root of an organizational problem. Um, when you see something going wrong uh, and people think they're communicating, they think if they sent an email to somebody, they've communicated. They think if they told somebody something that they've communicated. And that's kind of not the case. So communication's a, you have to understand what it is. You have to understand how it works because it's all about, you know, listening and hearing and speaking um, and making sure that uh, whatever you've said is acknowledged, um, but acknowledging that there's an issue. You don't necessarily have to acknowledge it publicly, depending on the issue, but you certainly have to acknowledge it internally so that you can address it. Um, empathy, when it becomes public, you have to show empathy. Uh, um, you know, depending on the issue, of course, but uh, if you don't show compassion and concern, your trust issues are gone. Uh, collaboration, you may have to work with people that you don't like to work with. You may have to work with people that you uh, don't uh, know, um, but collaborating is a big key in moving forward. Um, you want to repair whatever went wrong, and it depends on the degree of the issue, and repair can mean, you know, it could take place in 24 hours, it may take a year. Like I said, the blood centers, it's been a few years, they still haven't come back to the big, powerful, great organization that they once were. Um, apologies. I think um, this goes a long way. Um, if you look at, and I'm going to show some of these guys, the Me Too issue that's happening, some of these um, fellows that have been accused of all kinds of misdeeds, you will see some apologize, some didn't. How that works, uh, does it work for them? And, and, you know, so apologizing is a, is a big factor um, in moving forward. And controlled messaging, and that's that's probably the hardest thing because everybody starts talking, so everybody wants to talk, maybe it's internally, uh, employees want to talk, uh, bosses want to talk, or they don't want to talk, and sometimes they talk too much. Um, I have a card here, this is one, my one prop. I'll show you my little prop. And you might, might not be able to see it, but see this, it's just a business card, and all it says is stop talking. <laughs> now these have multiple uses, I acknowledge. Um, <laughs> I use it my husband. Um, but I actually use that because uh, I have a client that it's a child welfare agency and the, um, their PR guy um, is yappy and he's so hell bent on defending that they are in the right and that they did everything right and they were working on a case that involved the, uh, a mother who killed her child and he decided to do a media interview and I, I had encouraged him not to do the interview because I don't think he's the best because he talks too much. And so I said, all right, I'm going to be with you. I stood behind the cameraman and as my friend started blathering away, um, I held that card up in my hand so he could see it. And he has big brown eyes, should have seen it, just bugged out um, on camera, it was great. But he stopped. <laughs> so it's important. Um, so uh, it's about being prepared. Um, accept the possibility that you could be hurt, that something could go wrong and you could have a crisis. You have to be ready for the likely and unlikely. Um, holding statements. This is why I say just the slightest thing that you can do without having a PR person on board. A holding statement in phases is just a little general benign statement that says we're aware of the issue, you have your key messages about the strength of your organization, what you do. Um, we have no information at this time. You should have three of these holding statements at the ready at all times. And um, you can go online and, and Google them and get them and get samples of them. But this way, you're not scrambling around when something hits and trying to figure out what to say. You have a message already with your 
philosophies, your core values, um, but you're acknowledging something happened or not. But but holding statements are um, they're evergreen, so you can you should be able to just pull them out of the computer and give them to somebody that's asking you, even if it's something you want to post on your website to show a response. Um, know that you don't know what you don't know, and I put Mr. Rum Rumsfeld there because that's his that's his phrase. Um, it's really true. You just don't know what's coming. You don't know what's going to happen, and you know, accept it. It's okay. So I put this here because I like this graphic. I just like this photo. It really doesn't matter any, a whole lot. But um, a lot of issues in my world, uh, many of the things that I deal with are self-inflicted. Um, but there are others that are victims of circumstance. Um, and so clearly self-inflicted, I think it's fair to say most of those are avoidable. They're certainly embarrassing. Um, and they impact how you respond. So here's self-inflicted. Here, here, told you this was coming. These are self-inflicted, duh. Uh, and just so you know, that, that's Les Moonves down there. This woman, I wanted to be fair, <laughs> the woman is the mayor, former mayor of Nashville who had an affair with her security guy. Um, so she lost her job. These are victims of circumstance. That's Pulse nightclub. That's an aerial shot of the club. Uh, and that's a shot from the night of the shooting. And then this is uh, Emma Gonzalez. She's one of the uh, kids that survived the Parkland shooting. And what I wanted you to see is um, she has this shot on the left is, I think it's the shot on the right, the, um, that's her, yes, this is her uh, original photo, and it was manipulated to hold the Constitution where she's ripping up the Second Amendment, which is what the NRA did to her. So they put that, that went viral. So she had to deal with that second issue, but that's a social media, that's how they changed her photo. Um, you know, victim of circumstance. So social media in general, um, ha in my world for crisis management, it's just made it way more intense. Uh, and I have to move a lot faster, um, which is fine, I'm used to that. But the velocity and scope can just leave you stunned and in shock because sometimes you don't find out about an issue until you hear it or see it on social media. You know, something bubbles up on Twitter, something shows up on your Facebook page, somebody complains about you on Facebook and then it goes uh, and starts to get, a, a, you know, a huge um, following and comments. I'm working with a... a, a a college right now that has an issue um, that that's happening to some students are saying stuff and back and forth and it um, you know they're driving a story they're driving a false narrative and so the college is trying to figure out how to respond and when um, there are no boundaries clearly you, there and there you know people can say anything people do say anything doesn't matter they don't care if it's true um, and it will go anywhere. Um, there's no hierarchy. There's no one to call. There are no, you know, Twitter police. And I'll give you a, 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 a terrible example. Um, I represent the parents whose child was killed at Disney. And I still represent them. They have a foundation, the Lane Thomas Foundation. If you're interested, take a look at it. It's beautiful. Um, what they've done is remarkable. Um, but, you know, they're dealing with the loss of their child at Disney. And, um, you know, they're just trying to kind of make their way, they went back to Omaha where they live, and about, I think, the month after it happened, uh, Matt called me and said that they were told that there is a video of the actual gator attack taking their child off this beach, and that it's on Facebook. And of course, you can imagine these two parents, they're just terrified. And they said, can you find out, and is it you know, can you stop it? So I don't know anybody at Facebook. Well, I didn't um, uh, at the time. So I called a, a friend of mine who is in PR who I said, do you know anybody at the PR department at Facebook? And she did. So she called her friend who within 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, they checked because Facebook knows everything about everything. Um, and they checked and they said, you know, they do their analytics or whatever. And they said, there is no photo. It's not up here. And we will know about it uh, if it goes up and we will stop it. So I call Matt back and I tell him. So, of course, he thinks I walk on water now. Um, so, but, you know, if you don't know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, you are screwed. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's a problem. Um, uh, so in that, when that happens, it becomes more difficult to get ahead of an issue because it's out there. Um, and if, depending on how fast it's going, and I'm going to show you one that went really fast, um, that's, that's what's difficult. So ignoring social media, you do so at your own peril. You have to know what 
channels are out there. You have to know what's being said about your industry, your organization, your leadership, um, whatever regulatory matters that are relevant to you. You have to know that and you have to know what's being said out in that social world. And you really should be aware of who your trolls are, who doesn't like you, who are you, who's your opposition, who would come out against you if something went wrong. And those are conversations you can have way in advance. You know, do another retreat, go to a hotel, spend three hours and take your staff and go through that um, because everybody's got somebody uh, who doesn't like them for whatever reason, legitimate or not. Um, so when a social media crisis, like I just said, sometimes it's discovered after it's already gone viral, which is a real problem because uh, now you're chasing it. Um, they can hijack your business, they can hijack your social media sites, take over your Facebook, your Twitter, uh, your website, they, it can be done. Um, it ought to, in human nature is people are going to presume that it's true. Uh, and it requires an all-hands rapid response. And I will tell you, this is a, this is a big issue uh, because if you have uh, young employees and you, know, you tell them this is an emergency and it's like, well, okay, I'm gonna go get lunch first and then I'll come back, that doesn't work. Um, that's, that's, and you, you know, so whoever you choose on your teams to be involved in these kinds of issues, you gotta make sure that they understand the um, impact of this and the need for speed. Um, these are just some of the communications tw channels. I'm sure you all know these, you know, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, smartphones, blogs, newspapers, sad, um, website, live streaming, Yelp. Yelp is a big one. Um, let's see. This, I had a little trouble here with my thing, but this is the bad and good of social media. So here's the bad. The scope and speed of distribution, the credibility, tone, no boundaries, and the opportunity, which is clearly great. And here's the good. The scope and speed and distribution, credibility, tone, no boundaries and opportunity, because you can use all of those to your advantage. Um, you know, kind of what I said before, it can damage you, can hurt you quickly, it can't be erased. You cannot, I know there's reputation companies and all that, you, you really can't remove anything from the digital world. You can bump it down and bump it down, but it's really hard to remove anything. So the, the task is, how do you stop it from uh, continuing and how do, you, how do you bump it down and get the good news out, the, add the facts. Um, it does offer an opportunity for advocacy. Um, it's helpful for squelching rumors. So if something is being said, you can you know, respond right back and, and kill some of these rumors and things that are being said as well. And you can influence change. Um, so you have to know your audience. Where are they? Who are they? Where do they live? Where are they floating around? Are they on Twitter? Are they on Facebook? Are they on some other crazy thing that probably popped up, well, since I started this presentation, because there's so many of them. Where do they get their information? Um, where is their, so for your stakeholders, what do they like to look at? Where are they hanging out? You know, um, so if there is an issue, who, where are you going to go first to talk to them so they see your message? Other than everybody remember the telephone, just picking up a phone and calling somebody and telling them something, because that doesn't happen a lot either. Um, what's going to matter to your audience? What Are they going to care about this particular issue? Because sometimes they don't. It, if it's a, you know, it may have nothing to do with your supporters and your donors, but it still drags you into an issue. But it may not matter. And that's what you have to evaluate. Um, and how are they going to be impacted? And if so, how? Um, so, Social media versus traditional, I've kind of touched on that, but the you know, mainstream newspapers and broadcast, um, but these citizen journalists, you know, they get press credentials on occasion, so they are being legitimized. Um, they're, they're, I, I would tell you, I think the majority of them still are not. Um, they don't follow the basic tenets of journalism and the basic um, ethics of journalism, and there are ethics out there. I know that there's this, you know, this climate of you know, fake news, and, and I will tell you, I talk about this, I have a podcast, I talk about this, the news media has, has, has self-inflicted um, this credibility issue by the way they cover things and how they cover. Um, it's not necessarily fake. It's just bad coverage. Um, I think President Trump has a legitimate uh, gripe about how he is covered, as particularly in this week. And we could talk about the Kavanaugh issue because that's a whole crazy world. Um, but, but it's a real issue um, for news media because of how they have been working. Um, these self-appointed whistleblowers, whistleblowers is a legal term, um, but media like to use it and they legitimize a disgruntled employee by calling them a whistleblower because they're allegedly, supposedly, you know, um, doing something for the good of the organization by sharing information. Um, and so when I have those kinds of cases, I always say, they're not a whistleblower, they're just a big mouth. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't say that on the record. Um, 
but trolls, they chase you. Trolls are people that have nothing better to do. They just sit around, they look for somebody to attack. They have no clue what you do. They don't know about your organization. They don't care about you. That just looks like, uh, oh, that looks like fun. I think I'm going to pick on them. And they'll start writing crap about your group. Um, and I've seen interviews. If you, if you Google it and look at trolls, you'll see people interview and they say, well, why do you do that? And, I don't know. I just like it. It's fun. Um, angry employees, angry customers, those are biggies, uh, and conspiracy theorists. And if you Google me, you can go on to YouTube and you will see I have my own conspiracy theorist. Um, and he's created all kinds of videos about me. So they're out there too. But these guys are real. All of these folks are potential real threats just because of the power they have from social media. So hashtag what you can't do. You can't stop somebody. You can't stop somebody from calling CNN. Uh, they, they take those calls. Uh, you know hourly, minute by minute, um, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't stop somebody from posting images on their Facebook page uh, or Twitter, um, and um, you can't stop somebody from calling a newspaper tip line. Um, this um, uh, psychologist that is in this Kavanaugh issue, that's what she did. She called the Washington Post tip line. She called anonymously, but that's, but that's how the Washington Post found her. Um, you can't stop live streaming. Um, but what you can do is, um, as I said earlier, the strategies are pretty much the same. Um, the platforms are different, um, except that it can happen to you. I've said that there's a theme here, clearly. Um, have a basic plan. Have some kind of strategy. Have somebody on your teams that you know are able to communicate, uh, know how to you know, think clearly, can stay calm. That's a big one. Um, I think you all saw Audrey Perot yesterday. Was she, was she here yesterday? Um, I've worked with her to give for teaching on these kinds of things. Um, don't let fear take over because that will, you will lose. Um, hashtags and benign messages at the ready. Never, um, hashtags are great tools to have because Twitter is so quick and fast and, and broad that you should have your own kind of hashtag at the ready. And it might be like, uh, I'll, I'll use CFC Arts because that's what I'm involved with. CFC Arts is great. CFC Arts loves community. I mean, we have hashtags that are at the, you know, at the ready. Those are in addition to our regular hashtags. But you want to have something, um, choices, that you can just automatically have uh, the ability to respond to an issue that's bubbled up. You should have a moderation policy. Everybody know what that is? Okay, so a moderation policy is, it can be a paragraph, it can be three pages, but a moderation policy is what you post to say, we will, um, you know, we welcome, uh, you know, multiple voices and all kinds of comments and deep thought, different thoughts, diversity, all of those things, um, but we will, not, we will not accept foul language, um, you know, you put what you don't want um, and, and say, we will uh, remove anything that is, does not uh, comply with our moderation policy, and you can kind of spell it out. Uh, but it gives you the ground cover for when somebody says, oh, they pulled, my, they pulled my comments. Yes, we have a moderation policy, which we post once a month. It's, you can see it. Um, so you've got a little bit of cover there. Um, so you, have, you can execute and evaluate. And you evaluate while you are executing. How is this working? If you're pushing things out on, if you're responding on Twitter, how is it going? Are you seeing people following you? Are you seeing positive comments? Is the, is the topic changing? Are, you, are supporters coming out on Facebook, maybe? And I'm going to show you an example of it. Um, so you have to listen. You have to hear what's being said out there. So you should always have somebody monitoring your social media. Uh, even if it's a college student that's looking to make a few bucks, have somebody monitoring your social media. If, if your organization is big enough, you can uh, pay for services to do it. Um, I have one for me. Uh, I don't really care when somebody says anything about me, but I want to know about it. Um, so I have somebody, and, and I, I, it's so amazing when, you know, I'll get a, a little text at 10 o'clock at night and goes, hey, this just bumped up about you. Um, so you need, to, you need to know that. And what people listening can tell you, are they'll tell you who the trolls are. They'll see the consistency. They'll see the IDs, um, because all of that shows up. Um, you need to know if they're internal or external. Are those employees that are talking about your company, because that happens all the time, and they have a First Amendment right to do some of these things. Um, again, holding statement, and again, you know, execute and evaluate. Did you see my troll? See my little troll? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm by myself, you know, I gotta do this stuff. Um, the hashtags, keep them short, make sure they're relevant, that they have your name, uh, that they're positive, that they reflect your core values. Um, you wanna be a little bit unique, um, you know, 
uh, make sure that somebody else doesn't have it. That's why you got to do it in advance so that um, you're not, again, you want to not be scrambling. That scrambling stuff is awful. Uh, use it on uh, multiple channels, uh, you know, all your, all your digital. Um, and um, get others to use your hashtag to drive the positive response. That's totally fine to do. Uh, it, if somebody's attacking you, you gotta fight back. So fight back in a smart way and have fans, have friends, have people go, hey, I need you to respond to this. Can you, can you, you know, send out a, a response? Um, leverage all of these platforms, just like they're being leveraged against you. Understand them, know how they work. Uh, know, you know, again, who's on there. Be consistent. Uh, you know, you don't want to say one thing on one channel and something different on another. And that's the problem too, and that kind of goes back sometimes to your leadership going at. That is the problem that they have with this president. I'm reading Fear right now by Bob Woodward, and they talk about people having a conversation with President Trump, and Trump says, okay, we'll do this, and literally he can walk out of the room and then go out and say something else. And that's, the, that's a problem for this White House. I'm not being political. I'm just telling you kind of how it works. Um, but that's a problem with CEOs. I've had that. Uh, so you have to make sure you're consistent. So you should have key messages always about your organization, always at the ready. And those work into your holding statements. Um, communicate internally. This is the one thing that always gets overlooked. Uh, uh, leadership forgets about employees and they think employees may already know about it or they don't need to know about something. Um, I will tell you when I worked at Bright House, uh, the call center is the front line and if something goes wrong, if there's a power outage, if, you know, God forbid somebody can't watch, you know, the housewives for 20 minutes, um, you know, I, the front line needs to know. So um, I would get alerted and I would send out, I had a little system and my system was green, yellow, red. So green meant if, I, if you're getting a notice from the head of public affairs, you can look at it at, you know, you know, when you have some time. If it's yellow, when you're done with whatever you're doing, stop and read this. If it's red, stop what you're doing and read this right now. And when I've got one of those, it means media is showing up, there's something happening, take a look at it uh, so that you're aware because you're gonna start getting media calls. And media will call your front line and they'll ask, they'll act like they're a customer, they'll act like they're, you know, somebody interested and they'll ask you what's going on. And if your front line isn't ready, they're gonna say, oh my God, can you believe it? We had this huge outage, lines down everywhere. And that may not be the case. So you have to talk to your employees. So your front lines all need to be um, at the ready and your employees need to know. And it's a simple note to say, heads up, um, we have this issue that we believe is going to become public. These are the facts and give like a couple of, you know, we're not able to share all the information, but we want you to be aware of it. We want you to be informed so that you know what we're doing. Um, when you do that, your employees feel engaged and they feel better. They're not as inclined to go out and talk smack about you or respond or go to social media. If anything, if they do, you know, sometimes the hope is that they will do so in a positive way for you. Um, your third party advocates, get them involved, you know, partners, vendors, uh, donors, uh, whoever, your board members, get them involved, keep them aware. Um, use your strength and your friends. It's just the same thing as in life in general. When you have something go wrong in your life, it's your friends that are gonna help you and take care of you. And that's the same in this. Um, monitor, monitor, monitor. Uh, do not take the bait. Do not, you know, step away from the computer, put your phone down, don't respond. It's super hard to do, I know, but, but if you do it, you pay a price. Um, a little bit more, build a team. I recommend you do that in advance. Just a couple of employees, have them kind of understand, you know, what, what, you know, could happen. Um, in these meetings, I know this sounds sort of, sort of silly, but pay attention to privacy and confidentiality. How many times have you been in a meeting and you've got this confidential document, whatever, it could be, you know, whatever you're doing, maybe, you know, changing the way you operate or whatever. Um, and then, you know, you leave the door open and there's six pages, somebody left it on the table and then somebody else gets it and um, it's like, oh gosh, we didn't want that out. So you got to shut the door during meetings. People really do eavesdrop. <laughs> they do. Um, collaborate. Collaborate with other departments. Don't exclude anybody. Uh, collaborate with, uh, if you're in a particular industry, like uh, I'll use a, a gift, well, I'll give you one. Um, the Orlando Ballet and CFC Arts, where I'm involved, uh, ha shared a building and they got evicted from the building uh, because of mold and it was a city-owned building. It was a big, it was a big, big, big issue. You can't just pick up a ballet and move them. Uh, it's where they practice, where they rehearsed and they had their you know, their um, rehearsal halls and everything. Uh, so it was, a, it was a really big deal. Um, but they had separate leases. So they had different issues and different needs. But they collaborated with each other, even though they were both victimized and had different priorities. But they collaborated and both were able to find, 
you know, new a new venue. And to this day, there's a really beautiful collaboration. Um, leave your feelings at the door. If you're mad, if you don't like your boss, don't like your coworker, too bad. Everybody has to get through this. The reality is, if you're in an organization and the organization is in trouble and you don't work together, you all die together. Um, that's plain and simple. The organization goes out of business, so do you. So it's hard to do. And, and you know, we're kind of a whiny country sometimes and people just want to, you know, with social media, everybody can sort of say and, f you know, how they feel. And sometimes it's just not going to, it's just not the right thing to do. And you have to just suck it up uh, and work together. Diplomatically, of course. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this, uh, this uh, story here real quick with SeaWorld. I don't know how much, how's my time? Am I okay? Okay. Okay. So SeaWorld, uh, everybody knows what happened to SeaWorld. So this is a few years back. Well, Orlando Harley is, uh, has, is a business here and it's a very successful, it's like one of the top Harley dealerships in the country. And um, the, they had the uh, tragedy in 2010 with the trainer being killed. Um, they have an ongoing crisis. They are still dealing with it. Um, and then PETA kind of attacked them. So um, every year they had their country music concert and every year Orlando Harley participated. Orlando Harley is located just a few miles from SeaWorld. So they, the owner considers themselves their neighbors. And one day, uh, the owner calls me, this is uh, right before the concert, and some of the big country singers had, had uh, backed out of the concert because of all the bad press that SeaWorld was getting, so they didn't want to be affiliated with it. That's the other part, you know, so then you start losing people, like, oh, you're in trouble, I don't want to be seen with you, you're bad. Um, so, Orlando Harley's Facebook page started, it got hijacked, which is what I mentioned before, and by hijacked, I mean, they took it over. And so Ann uh, called me and said, go look at my Facebook page. Literally, it looked like, you know when you're putting gas in your car and the numbers are going as you're filling the tank? That's what it looked like. It was comment, comment, comment. It was just one after the other. And, you know, how dare you? SeaWorld is bad. They are, you know, they are bad to animals and you shouldn't be supporting them. We're going to boycott Harley. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to support you. You are evil. They could say, they just said all kinds of terrible things. So I said to Anne, you have a couple of options. And I said, first, you can do, I said, you can back, before I said back out of the concert, she stopped me and said, no one's going to tell me how to run my business. Now, granted, she's in a business, so, you know, it's for profit. Um, but, you know, she rides a Harley, so she's tough. And she said, she said nobody's going to tell me how to run my business. And I said, okay, well, then we're going to respond. So I posted a, I had to write it because they didn't have anything and kind of probably wouldn't for something like this. But um, so I wrote a statement. I'm going to show it to you. And uh, we posted it on the Facebook page. Now, they knew it was PETA. And the reason they knew was, be, and they knew where the comments were coming from is because very big, successful business. She had somebody that monitored her social media because they used it so much. This monitoring was uh, a geo, geo directed. So she had a big elaborate monitoring system that they could tell where the comments were coming from. Not one of them, not one was from Florida. So she knew it wasn't her audience. It wasn't her community. Uh, and so it, not that that would have mattered to her, but we had, a, we had information. So, um, so we posted this comment. And this is actually what we posted. And it says, I'm going to read it to you because I want to focus on kind of the key points in it. Um, she sa it says, as a longtime resident of Central Florida, that means I live here. This is my town. Um, we've built a valued relationship, not just with our customers and fans, but with other businesses in our community as well. That would be SeaWorld. Those are our neighbors. We're all in business. Um, this year, as we've done before, we'll, par we'll be participating in Bands, Brews, and f Concert. Um, so guess what? We're still doing it. We know you're saying these things about us, but we're, we're still going. Like the multitude of community events we participate in, this is just one of many that we participate in. We're very actively engaged. It's family oriented. We care about family. That's who we are as a business. Um, it's fun and it's a great opportunity for people to come see the very best of us. It is about us, not you. We want our motorcycles and our product to be seen at a fun place uh, and we've always done it um, and it's always been a great, a great event. Now this is what's important. 
This is where it comes to acknowledgement. Certainly, we are aware of the public discussion about SeaWorld. Uh, we respect that there are differing viewpoints. So we ask that our decision to participate in a family-oriented experience at the festival be respected as well. So we're, we aren't arguing with you about what you're saying about SeaWorld. So we, we get it. Uh, and, you know, we're not saying we agree or not. But we're, so we respect what you're doing, but we ask that you give us that same opportunity. And literally, when we posted that, I'm going to say within about five minutes, we saw the shift. And we saw the fans start coming out and people just praising Orlando Harley. Good for you. Way to go. We'll come to the event. And we saw it, the, the negative ones stopped just within that short time, time period. So this is, a, this is what I say is a benign statement. It does, she's not fighting, um, she's not arguing, um, she's taking a position, it's respectful, it's diplomatic. Um, she, I mean, um, I wrote this, there's, very, the, there's a strategy in here, these words, every word you know, matters and it means something and the way these sentences are constructed. This took me about, it took me about an hour and a half to write, and she approved it right off the bat. And I walked her through and explained it just like I explained it to you. Um, so uh, here's a, another one. Uh, let me think. This, one, this one's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> this was a nonprofit that uh, they had an employee who uh, was a disgruntled employee. And it was a child welfare place, so they had a uh, group home. And this employee had another employee record her on her smartphone, smack one of the kids that lived there. It was horrible. Then they gave it to news media because they didn't like the boss, they didn't like the company, and so they gave it to news media. Um, and it went out. Um, yeah, it, it appeared on TV, and then I guess they posted it on YouTube. Then uh, we heard about it because the TV station started promoting the story on Twitter. That's how we learned about it. We didn't know they were doing the story. They didn't call, which is, you know, an ethical issue, I would argue. Um, no opportunity for us to respond to that story. It just aired. So, of course, everybody's caught off guard. Everybody's in shock. Uh, the owner is, she was, I have to say, she was just a total goofball. Um, she ignored everything that we advised her to do. Because uh, the next day, we were going to respond, we were going to call TV, we were going to, you know, we immediately started internal investigation. Who was the employee? How did this happen? Was it real? Was it not? We determined it was false, that it was staged. I mean, they really did hit this child. So, of course, you know, all of that had to be dealt with. Um, but we told her, they called me and said, we have this issue. They were not my client before this happened. Uh, and so I told her, I need you to stay home. Uh, don't be available. Media's going to show up tomorrow. This is a big story. This is going to be a second day story on it. And she said, no, 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 no. I have to be there. My employees need to see me. They love me. I have to be there. And I said, you can talk to them by phone. You can Skype. You just need to not go there. And uh, I said, they're, they're going to kind of wait for you. And it's going to be one of those stories where this little woman drives up uh, and they're going to come at your door and they're going to try to talk to you. And she argued, argued, argued. And then she agreed not to do it. Next morning, she went down there, um, and she called the office and told them she was coming. And don't you know, she's calling me at 10.30 saying, oh my God, I drove to the back of the building and the reporter was there. Um, and sure enough, they have video of the reporter hitting her window with the microphone saying, I just want to talk to you. And she looks, she backs off and drives off into the, <laughs> into the sunset. Was everything wrong? Because she just didn't listen. Um, so in this, we knew that more stories were going to come uh, because this was a big deal. You, you know, you just don't want your caretakers to be hitting children. Um, ultimately, uh, she had to step down and we had to, uh, we went to the news media because now we're hearing more and more about the internal operations and some of the problems. We knew, we confirmed that it was a setup, that it wasn't the way the home was run. And um, we knew the VIT, so, so we had all that. So we quietly went to the news, uh, I think it was the managing editor of the TV station, and we went, we said we wanted to talk to him off the record, which means you can't use it, uh, you can't identify us, you can't use this information. We just want you to know what we know, and we will tell, and then we will go on the record and talk about the issue. We just need you to hear the background first, then you can ask us stuff. And we said, this thing is a setup, we have employees that are problem. Um, it's a disgruntled employee. They don't like the owners. And oh, and that's how the media found her, by the way, is the employees knew she was coming. And so they called TV and they said, she's going to come to the back of the building. So here's what car she drives. Here's where she'll park. So, hey, 
So your employees will do that. Not your employees, but employees. Um, so uh, they had to, they, you know, over the next six months, there was a reorganization and all that. So the, the, the news manager agreed to go off the record. We, we told him everything. We, we, we acknowledged all of these things. They ended up not doing any other stories on the organization. And we were just lucky because there wasn't any really good video after that. I mean, there's nothing. We don't have any more um, children being hit. We don't have any more owners driving away. So TV didn't really care about it and the newspaper didn't care at all. So I'm just saying that sometimes these things, if somebody's telling you not to do something, sometimes it's a good idea to listen. <laughs> uh, ultimately, they went out of business, by the way. They could never recover because they couldn't get good management. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to show you one more. I'm going to skip all this. So Starbucks. Y'all remember this one? This is just last year. Um, except when Starbucks had the issue with the two uh, African-American men that went in uh, and that whole thing blew up, I wanted to raise this because the background is that's their, their uh, brand is that they're uh, socially responsible and that they're progressive and they launched their Race Together campaign. Remember that? You're supposed to go into Starbucks and when your barrister or whatever barista guy gives you your coffee, you're supposed to have a conversation about race relationships because that's just the ideal uh, circumstance to do that. Um, so it backfired on them. That was a failed, it was a failed effort on the part of employees as well as uh, on the public. So they got all this criticism because the CEO was white and he was a billionaire. Uh, they had no real depth to that um, campaign um, and it was clumsy and it was insulting and it blew up on the internet. So they apologized. They did the right thing. Well, we're really sorry. It was kind of thoughtless and really didn't have much, you know, really kind of a bad idea. And then boom, this happens. And this staffer, you know, they have two African-American men just sitting around, not bothering anybody. And this employee calls in and, you know, calls 911 and Everybody kind of knows what happened there. Um, turns out they were business executives just ha waiting for a meeting just like anybody else and they get arrested. So I raise this because it, it, you know, others recorded it on, the phone, on their phones. They put it out on Twitter, YouTube. News media picks it up. It went on for days. Uh, they ended up having protesters, uh, national boycott, and Starbucks is doing the Abu Dhabi shuffle. And they're trying to figure out a way to respond to this and try to fix it. And I have to say, um, it was pretty clumsy. You know, initially they didn't fire the employee, which as, as, you know, who knows what she was thinking, but they should have terminated her immediately and said, we don't tolerate that. Um, and they didn't. And they just said, well, she's working at a different store. So she can just do it someplace else. Um, so it was a very clumsy response. Um, so, and this is what happened to them. They're not who they say they are. They're not a cliving to their culture. Um, they apologized everywhere, kind of meaningless. Um, the police officers were claiming they did their job. I can tell you, I'm married to one. Police officers used, you know, they're allowed to make different decisions than that, and they clearly didn't make good decisions. So, what up with those guys? Police officer, the uh, police chief, you know, kind of um, stuck up for his guys without really knowing the facts. So, and then he's got to do an apology. Uh, and then they shut down for, you know, an afternoon to do the racial bias training, which was actually a really good thing. They should have done that immediately. Um, and then the city of, bro well, brotherly love is covered in goo. Um, so there you go. See, they're getting, and here it is. There's the 911 call is available. You can actually hear that. So everything that happens in your organization is out, is, is up for public uh, debate and review. Um, and this is some of the fallout. There's the CEO, um, some of the protest signs. There's the police chief. Let's see. There's some of those, those are those apologies. All of this stuff's available on, you know, you can go and look, Google it. It's where I got it. Um, but you can see the media coverage. It was egregious. So, New York Times, this is the follow-up. And these two men showed the ultimate grace uh, and, you know, didn't sue, uh, but talked about uh, getting uh, scholarship programs uh, uh, initiated by Starbucks. So, not a new issue for them. They should have shown a stronger voice. They should have apologized to the two men, which they didn't do. Um, but what they did do is they apologized through social media. They accepted blame um, and they took some quick steps, but maybe just not enough. So here's your takeaway. 
Every issue is different. There are no two alike, um, except maybe for Starbucks. Um, know your strengths and where you're vulnerable, and have some fundamentals in place. You know, be prepared as best as you can. Pay attention to what's going on in your universe, what's happening, what's trending in your industry, because you need to know that. Are you susceptible to some kind of criticism, depending on what's being said or happening? Collaborate. Stay calm. Keep, keep emotion out of the decision making. Listen to social media. And don't be afraid to defend yourself appropriately. Um, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. I say maybe 60 seconds at this point. So that's it. Oh, that's my podcast. <laughs>